I want to begin with an opening uh, question to our, our two uh, kind of responders beyond the panel discussion, which is we just heard a kind of narrative that says, in effect, pollution equals uh, a kind of the problem that creates climate change. We also heard a call for clean water, and there's a pollution route to that. And then I think in transportation, we kind of understand fundamentally that vehicle miles traveled with, uh, it can be addressed and reduced significantly, and therefore the pollution that comes with those vehicle miles are reduced significantly with multimodal transit systems. So you see, it's all very simple, just stop polluting. <laughs> so so it, it, is it? <laughs> Is that what we have to do to get to the health returns, the economic returns, and the ecological services that we're looking for? And I'd just like to have Jim from Transportation give us a kind of his reflections on that thought, and also Linda, uh, uh, before we go into open questions from the audience. And FTA, as you know, is the um, mobility manager for the region. It is our responsibility to provide public transit for this region here in our county. Um, but it's also our responsibility to make sure that uh, we do it in a clean and responsible way. We have two projects right now that we're working on. Um, transit Options uh, Buffalo, basically providing uh, transportation between Amherst and um, uh, Buffalo through uh, the, uh, our light rail system, possibly a BRT. And this is a project that we're working on with a number of uh, players within the city of Buffalo, as well as this region. And it's important that it's not necessarily a rail extension, but other alternatives, um, increased bus usage, possibly uh, BRT, as I mentioned earlier, um, as well as other factors that will create an enhanced transportation option between North and South Campus, as well as extending into uh, downtown Buffalo. The other is the Niagara Street Quarter Project. Um, that is a, a, a redevelopment of all transit activity within the um, Niagara Street from downtown Buffalo out to Niagara, Ontario. And it will include some pretty uh, significant elements. Um, new bus stop, enhanced bus stops with next bus technology, um, traffic signal priority systems, compact transit center and the purchase of CNG buses and we're working closely with the city of Buffalo in its complete street elements along that Niagara Street quarter project so those are the things that the authority is going to making sure that you know it's a su sustainable community um, with transportation Hi, um, your question is uh, uh, to uh, to have better health clean water um, uh, better climate issues. Should we do we need to just stop polluting? Yes. <laughs> right, that, that's the answer. Okay. I'll read that. Um, and I, I think one of the things that was so exciting about these three wonderful presentations is that it talked about how we actually go about this. And I, I saw a wonderful sign the other day that said, "The people are too big to fail." And that means you and me and the rest of us. It's time to stop talking about the banks being too big to fail and start taking it into our own hands and saying that the people are too big to fail and we will not let you pollute us, kill us, cause bad health to our children and cause this world to collapse because of putting fossil fuels into the air. So, so the answer is very simple. How we're going to do it is a little bit more difficult, but I think it's, it's serious and it's going to have to start with us because if it doesn't start with us, it's not going to happen anywhere um, because power can teach nothing, we all know, um, and if we don't take it back into our own hands, um, that we will suffer the consequences. One of the more profound things I think I learned in, in something just past kindergarten was that, um, that you, you kind of have to take care of your kind of citizen responsibilities, the stuff next to you, and that being a citizen is dealing with all of those dynamics in some fashion. I think that's where Linda's going with this, and what's our citizenship responsibility. And the other thing is that things that seem really, really complicated have a really simple foundation, like, oh my God, it's pollution. Every one of the three presentations we had had at its root. What are we doing to ourselves?
When I say mobility manager, that's more of an academic thing. Um, we're basically responsible for all transit. Um, the authority's legislation uh, back in 1967 was <coughs> surface, the, the port of Buffalo, since we own all this waterfront land, or about to sell it, um, as well as the airport. So we are a default mobility manager. But when we refer to access, yes, we, we do agree that uh, being able to get from one point to another is very important. In 2010, we did a major study. We looked at our entire system. And what we found was that the majority of our service was trying to get to areas outside of the city. Okay? And we had 80% of the individuals that were within our urban core, what we consider our urban core, um, not being served effectively. And it was an, an issue that was uh, mentioned in one of the panels. The speakers had talked about land use and transportation. And are we um, um, extending that sprawl by providing bus service to these areas where individuals are trying to get jobs? Yes, we are. It's a fine line that we have to, um, to walk when individuals come and say, I need bus service out there. So we'll, we'll try to set up a transportation plan for an individual that needs to get to a job and within six months they buy a car and that bus is empty. So what we did is we rethought our system. We, we, we basically retrenched. We provide great service. Um, we were talking about the west side. The number three grant. How many are familiar with the number three grant? The number three grant we had 15 minute service. The study said we put 10 minute service on. Right now we're at five minute headwinds. Bus is coming every five minutes. Why? Because that's a very high transit dependent population that lives there. But that is still in an area within the urban core. So yes, we agree that providing that access, but what comes with that is the responsibility of not just the authority, but also business owners and the region to provide you know, funding to extend that service. So the best way to do that is uh, make more incentives for riding public transit and more disincentives for driving car. Uh, the greatest way to create disincentives for driving is to increase the cost of driving. Uh, gas prices are sort of kept artificially low in this country, and we have the free parking that I was talking about, lots of free parking in uh, the Buffalo metro area at the end of our trip. So uh, we can begin to work on that. I think the green code actually is a step in the right direction for uh, supporting um, sustainable um, uh, travel in neighborhoods. Um, but I think uh, one thing that we um, can do with public transit is actually uh, create the demand. If we can create more demand for public transit, our transit agencies would be happy to meet that demand, and they can do that quite easily, but we've got to create the demand. Talk to your meetings. So does everyone else agree? Is this the ask? Um, and then on top of that, I mean, outside of that, it's, it's, it's actually asking them. I mean, that's the first step, right? <laughs> Specifically with a private business. Well, and then we can talk more, you know, because I don't want to monopolize the time here, but I'm passing I've got about six hands and lots of The NFTA is not the answer. Um, we have a core network that we provide service for. There are about 16 routes that basically operate into the first three suburbs, into major job destinations, malls, and stuff like that. Further out, we have to start developing, and we, I'm saying the NFTA, um, as well as developers, is these private, public-private relationships that it's the first mile, last mile, as we say in the industry. We'll get you to a point, but can someone else provide the service from that point where we have great service and then a small circulator that would take you into these communities? So we're beginning to do these. And we have a study in uh, North Taiwan that we're looking at um, to do that, to pull our service back to the core and then have others pay for and operate the circulator service.
the, the, we've always heard of the reference of the creaking infrastructure. That is the issue for our nation moving forward, whether it's our rail infrastructure or water infrastructure or sewer infrastructure. Um, what we're seeing now in Buffalo as a prime example is a long-term commitment to improving that infrastructure. And those are the opportunities to have the multiplier effects, the, the multiple benefits, the triple bottom line. Any dollar that's going into any kind of infrastructure project, what is the social, economic, and ecological benefit, triple bottom line, out of, out of these investments? And that is where the community voices are heard. So if you um, start to understand that a sewer project might be happening in your neighborhood or in your area, there's an opportunity for your either your street or your neighborhood to see some kind of multiplier effect or higher impact. The, the push community is a great example of what's happening right now in those areas. And the same thing can be told for all transportation infrastructure investments as well. Um, so it's it's staying informed. It does. There is a proactive um, approach to this. It's and historically and generationally, we've always been reactive, right? We we hear about something that's been decided, and then we point fingers and say, no, you're doing it the wrong way. It takes a little bit more energy and a little bit more proactive to kind of keep track of what's going on before those key decisions are made. New York State is a home rule state. To kind of reference the previous question. A lot of key important decisions are made at the local level, and then sometimes it gets too far down the line for you to, to augment or to modify that. Call up your supervisor, your mayor, your council member. They represent you. They will sit down with you, and they will have a conversation with you, and those conversations can be long-lasting, even if it's a five-minute conversation, if you're clear on your message and what is the goal that you want to see in the outcome for your community. The biggest water quality issue of our generation will be pharmaceuticals in our water supply. Um, there are pharmaceuticals out there that we know, such as hormones and, and, and some other things that are in the medications, that end up in our drinking water supply because the systems don't exist to filter them out. We are consuming pharmaceutical waste. Um, not to say the sky is falling, but that's the reality. Very few chemicals that are in use are actually regulated. Um, some folks will think that if you have um, your, your DEC or EPA regulating things that then we're safe, but it's, they only regulate maybe about 5 or 7 percent of all chemicals in use out there. Um, so it, it's being aware of that microbeat pollution in the Great Lakes is an issue. So again, all the other questions I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Yeah, I very much like your idea about uh, street space as being public space that we all want to use in different ways as we're traveling by different modes. It's a great idea. Um, I wish you could be running the U.S. Department of Transportation in Washington for us. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, you also mentioned this. Uh, well, well, one idea is to charge uh, people for car usage, charge them for using the streets. Um, that wouldn't be very popular, but where it's done is in highway tolling. So there's some uh, places where you actually pay to use a road, uh, sometimes they're private roads, sometimes they're public road, but you're paying a fee to use that road. It's a user fee. Um, you mentioned this idea about uh, sort of shared mobility, and we could think of um, car sharing as a really good example of that. So Buffalo Car Share has been around for a few years now. And uh, people don't own a car, but they pay a small fee to join Buffalo Car Share, and then they pay to use the car share. We have Buffalo Bike Share. Um, I hear that some of the large um, automobile manufacturers are sort of envisioning a future where a person buys a share of an automobile but doesn't really own it, and then nearby there would be parking lots with, um, for example, a bunch of Toyotas, and you would go down and use one. So it's, I think your idea is not really that outlandish in that we can sort of think of sharing our street space in better ways. Sure, just a, just a couple of comments. One, you mentioned the disproportionate cost of transit. Um, two things, one, just 30 cents, about 30% of every dollar that goes in the fare box comes from individuals. The rest comes from local, state, and some federal dollars to operate our service. It's very costly to operate public transit. On average, about $125 this year per hour to operate the service. It's pretty costly when you're extending service in front of reaches of the, uh, the region. So that's what goes into that cost. The other thing is there's a disincentive to um, individuals to take public transit, to 
mostly areas outside of our urban pool. And I keep saying that because there is a disincentive. What happens is companies will build their building, and two or three days later they'll say, uh, NFTA, we need some bus service. And we'll provide the bus service if it's close and it's convenient for us. But what happens is we get there, the individual gets there using public transit, and they have to go over a berm, no sidewalk, through a parking lot that's not, uh, um, the sidewalks are not plowed to the back door. But the individual that's driving the car, it's paid, and there's a cost associated with that. And if you were to take that, that cost of that parking space and spread that out through all the individuals, that's a perk for that individual. So what we're pushing is to have companies assist the individual that's taking public transit in their public transit costs, a couple of hours, ten dollars, or whatever. What we're seeing through the sprawl is that what we're doing is we're transforming land that was productive from an environmental and ecological perspective that was good for the water cycle, um, that cleaned the air and all this stuff, and we trans transport that into houses and lawns and, and roads and stuff. And what we've done is we've reduced the ability of the earth to sustain itself in any kind of a reasonable sort of way. Um, and it pollutes the air, we talk, talks to pollutes the water, um, and so these things are, are absolutely connected all the way from the beginning. And so I think we need to, to think about land use, we think it needs to think about pollution, we need to think about climate change, we need to think about transportation exactly is a part of the same thing. And we're always, we seem to be talking, as you were saying, in terms of mandates, in terms of fixing the system and sort of trans, instead of transforming the system. And we have a system that's based on fossil fuel, it's based on cars, and we need to transition off of that system into a new energy system the way that we did 150 years ago when we started to use electricity and we started to use fossil fuels. It's time. We can do it. Well, the flipping comment would be just thank you for being caring enough and committed enough to your community to spend time to do this. These actions, like I said before, speak louder than words. Continue to do that within your own communities and look to the NGO community to help support you and provide backup information as you need it moving forward. So we're here to all work together, so thank you. So I, I have a couple closing comments. Um, the, the first is trying to just kind of touching back on the issue of is pollution the only problem or is, is pollution the pro predominant uh, source of health issues? And I, I actually said I would, I would kind of push yes and it's also inequality and access to power. And I think that's something that's slightly been touched on, but not not really. Um, some people have power and others don't. <laughs> and so when we're looking at folks that make these decisions, they're people who have power. Uh, and it, it can come it can come across just as little as, you know, there's there's been a lot of conversation around call your elected official. Well, what happens when your elected official won't be with you? Because you don't have enough power, right? And I also just want to touch on this idea of just moving. Um, I think there's something intrinsically wrong with telling people that if you have a problem in your community, you move. Because folks have, th th this is something our members deal with all the time. Well, why don't you just move? Well, <laughs> if you own the house, if, if, if you've invested your life in that neighborhood, why should you have to change your entire life because somebody else is not following the law? Um, so I just, I, I think it just, again, it's also about power, and it's about how we view um, people who aren't necessarily powerful, right? Okay. So, closing comment, um, you know, the, the authority uh, that every session we go to, every place we go, it seems that we get beat up on. And, and for the past few years, this is something that I've taken to heart. Uh, it's okay because we are part of the equation that's moving this region forward. Every major initiative, every single major initiative that's happening here in this region, the NFTA is part of it. So we are beginning as an, as an organization um, to start looking at how we fit into that equation and how we to be responsible for moving it forward. So thank you and um, we'll, we'll be around. Um, one of the uh, themes I think that we heard about today was this idea of transportation equity.
who pays, how much do they pay, are they overburdened, do they pay a fair amount? And that's a really good conversation to have. When you uh, hop on the NFTA bus and you pay a $2 fare, uh, the cost of that ride is about $6, as James said. So about $4 is subsidized uh, by our county and state government. Uh, when you are uh, acting as a driver, you're receiving subsidies, even more subsidies than that uh, bus rider. Um, I uh, like the idea that came up that we think about streets as sort of shared space, and we're now thinking with this complete streets movement about really uh, reconceptualizing uh, the way we use those streets. Uh, and then for the gentleman who um, uh, talked a little bit about sprawl, uh, he, he said that we really need to think about land use. And uh, if you think about the first question I asked you, is you, did you travel at all today? Uh, and the answer is yes. So it's this idea of separation of activities by land use that requires us to travel anywhere to begin with. Uh, during the maybe second half of the 20th century, uh, there was sprawl in Buffalo and everywhere in the US. Um, people moved to the suburbs and it led to a really high quality of life. One of the highest uh, life qualities uh, in the world in the US was the suburban lifestyle with an automobile. Uh, now we're paying the price. Um, someone could argue that no one in the Buffalo area should be allowed to build a new building for a business because we've got lots of empty buildings in the core and in the first ring suburbs and no one should be allowed to build new housing because we've got housing that could be filled up. So uh, with the green code and other uh, thoughts today, we can think about reinvigorating our city center and near in neighborhoods where sustainable transportation makes a lot of sense. I think that the Peterson Planning School is, is absolutely critical because it changes our imagination about our role with respect to planning and the civic structure. Uh, we live in a society right now that tries to isolate us and separate us. You know, if you buy this, you'll be okay. Or if your kid has this, then they'll do X, Y, Z. And suddenly, we're told that everything we have to do is individual. And what that is, is a strategy by people in power to make sure that we don't take action. So one of the things we have to do is that we have to really organize ourselves um, to confront this thing. And I, I know I'm sounding a little bit like a broken record, but if, if, for example, if the predictions that they talk about with climate change are real and that we have about 15 years to turn things around, we better get organized really quickly. And it's not going to happen because we take shorter showers. It's not going to happen because of us doing tiny little things. It's going to happen because we, like us here at the Citizen Planning School and the One Region Forward and all of these nonprofits that you're working with, take collective action to address this issue of power inequality, the role of money. One of the things that we get told all the time that there's not enough money, man, there is so much money in this world. It's just that it's isolated and segregated into small little pockets of people. And we need to, this should be public money. Those people made their money because we provided the infrastructure and the resources for them to be able to do this. So come on, we're too big to fail. The people are too big to fail. It's time to get organized and let's go for it. Um, you know, this, this commentary from the audience forward has been a powerful one because all of you in a different way have spoken about reimagining how we think about a sustainable future. And that new imagination, uh, and, and Tisha gave it to us right off the bat, that transit is public. And if you sort of accept that notion, then you can roll into the choices we make as public choices within that frame. Water is public. If we really embrace that concept, we treat it differently, and it treats us better as a result. I think the issues of inequality and access to power, which we did talk some in the last class about, are really a recognition that, I'm sorry, our leaders are public. We make them leaders. And so our engagement of them, and if they're, if they're not letting you in, we know how to beat the door down. But that part of it, that there's no victims here, it's us. We are the public. So leaders are public, we're public, water is public, transit is public. One of the dimensions that goes to this sort of debate, like just move, no, <laughs> or whatever, and there's other constraints and it's not fair, or maybe it is, is everything comes with a cost. An ecological cost, a social cost, a, 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 an issue attributed to equity. We should pay the real cost 
And then in a democratic structure, the people can make the choices. What's it really cost to drive your car? What's it really cost to pollute the water? What's it really cost to distribute across the landscape as opposed to concentrate in village, town centers, and the city centers? And there's a place for villages, there's a place for town centers, and there's a place for urban centers. So if we think about the real cost across the full spread, full cost accounting, if you want to be the economic in the day, but full cost accounting in equity and justice as well, you get a very different picture of one region forward. We're a little smarter today than we were two hours ago. Uh, and, and I just thank you all and thank this panel. Thank you.